All right. Book of Ephesians. We started this last Sunday. Ephesians chapter 2. We began to look at the process of maturity and perfection in Christ as it's laid out in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is a book showing you the process of maturity and perfection in Christ. And Paul basically divides this into three sections. Sit, walk, and stand. Sitting deals with our position in Christ. That's our positional, positional standing in Christ. Until a person understands this position, they can never be perfected in Christ. Okay? What did Paul teach us to seek? Seek those things which are above where Christ what? Set your affections on things above, not on the things of the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid where? With Christ and God. How can you live without seeking those things? You can't. If you want to live in this life, your life is seated at the right hand of God. So you have to understand the position. The walk, now this is what I said last Sunday, the walk, a person gets over to Ephesians 4 and they see the word walk worthy. They just tear off like a, like a, like a crazy person out here trying to do a bunch of stuff. Amen? This is what walking worthy means to me, right? I go out here and do this. This is me walking worthy. Walking worthy is Christ in you. What did God call you to be? He called you to be a member of his son's body. He called to make you a head or, or a member of the head of all principality and power. This is what God called you to be. He called you to be a member of the body of Christ. Therefore, we cannot walk worthy of that calling until Christ is first formed in us. The worthy walk has to do with Christ being perfected in you and then he comes down and stands dealing with the power of Christ perfected in you. And this power of Christ in you puts you above all the principalities and powers that are now in heavenly places, the spiritual wickedness that is now in high places. Amen? Satan has gained power and victory in this world, folks, through the ignorance of the body of Christ. Nothing more. Amen? Now, this process we saw last week, there's two main hindrances to the maturity. Two main things is going to stop this Christian maturity in your life. Once again, has nothing. you're saved because of that right there. You're not going to hell when you die because of your position in Christ. Amen? But two things will hinder this right here. These things. Christ in you and standing in all that power of God. Number one, the, the first hindrance to these things is a man who seeks perfection through the flesh rather than the spirit. Yeah. Amen. Listen, your union to Christ is spiritual. Yeah. The only way you can seek heavenly things, you can't seek them physically. Nope. They're not in victory. They're not at the Catholic church. Right. Amen. Amen. Where are they at? The book of Ephesians begins with being blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You've got it. How do you find it? Well, they're spiritual. It's first, the first thing we're all going to have to do in our life is come to the conclusion that we want those things more than anything else in this world. You want the spiritual blessings that Christ hath freely given you 
and that God has freely given you in heavenly places, you're going to have to determine that knowing those things and knowing Jesus Christ is the priority that dominates your life. If knowing Him doesn't dominate your life, then what are you, what's the point in any of it? I would advise if any of you came to this building this morning for any other reason other than to know Him, you're wasting your time. Amen. And so you got people out here that's seeking perfection through religion and, and, and per earthly performance and works of the flesh rather than seeking perfection through the life of Jesus Christ imparted by the Spirit of God. And then you got positional only Christians. This is what dominates my, you know, the people that I identify with. The mid acts dispensationalist. What dominates the mid acts people is a position only. No application of the position. Paul begins here with the position, but then he brings you into chapter 4 and, and basically tells you that this position in Christ that should lead to a worthy walk in the world of Christ being perfected in you. Amen. Bill, he seated me in heaven so that his son could be seated in me. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 3, 17, Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That is the indwelling of the Son of God. You say, I thought I got that at salvation. You see, everything's positional to people. Paul's writing to Christians here and he's saying, he's saying, God gave me a special dispensation of grace to impart to you. So my prayer is that these riches of this glory and understanding this great mystery, that the Spirit of God will take these riches, strengthen your inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. What's he talking about? He's talking about those who are now seated in heaven, unified to the Lord Jesus Christ, that this, that this union of them in Christ would perfect them. That's the fellowship of the mystery. Amen? The fellowship. And so, these positional only believers, let me give you an example. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, 8. Positional only people. Every verse in the Bible is positional. You know? Look at Philippians 3, 8. How, how old is Paul here? I ain't sure about his age. I know, how, I know about how long he's been saved at this point. You're looking, you're looking at a, about a 30-year vet right here. Right? When Paul writes Philippians... My goodness, you realize what Paul has wrote by the time he wrote Philippians? He wrote Romans, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. He, he's probably already penned Ephesians by this point. You realize the material that man has wrote that is going to be preserved by God for thousands of years, for all generations? You realize what that man knew and understood? You know what he says? Look what he says in verse 12. Not as though I'd already attained. Either were already perfect. Amen. You know what? That's why it's hard for me to take people on Facebook serious. Amen. These know-it-alls, man, these word police always trying to correct everybody. Here's, here's a man, Bill, that... 30 years into this thing, he said, I'm not perfect and I've not yet attained, but this is one thing I do. I forget what's behind and press on to what's before. Yeah. But there's nothing in these passages that is positional. Look at what he says in verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. That ought to be the priority of our life. If I, if I tell you that God has made it so that you can know Him, that ought to be the most important thing in your life. Yeah. Not religion. 
Not knowing that you're not Israel. Well, I ain't Israel and I'm not under a tithe and I'm not under the law. Do you know him? Because the rest of it's just pointless religion. Paul said, I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win what? Christ. Christ in you. What a prize. God, that God, God's son, Bill, will indwell me. Paul says, and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. You notice the colon there at the end of the verse? Paul's going to explain that. Meaning it's not positional or imputed righteousness. Paul is talking about a real working righteousness in him through faith. It is Christ in him. How can you be indwelt by Christ and not have righteousness? Now you can be in Christ positionally and still be under the controlling influence of the flesh. But Paul said at the beginning of Philippians, he says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. If Christ is in you, there is a production and a fruitfulness of righteousness in you. It's the outworking of the life of Christ. And so now he says, he says, he's going to explain it, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. There's nothing positional here. It's all about the outworking of the position. God put you in Christ to know him. God put you in Christ to be indwelt by him. God put you in Christ to be filled with him. God put you in Christ to make you righteous. All these things God put us in Christ for. And so positional only Christians never get it. They never get it. They run, they run to a verse like Philippians 3.10 and that's positional only. I'm, I'm found in him and clothed with his righteousness. Positional only. Look at Colossians 1.27. Last place here. Every, every preacher that I've ever heard, majority of them, makes Colossians 1.27 a positional verse. Christ is not in Listen, every, every man that's saved is in Christ and every man that's in Christ has Christ positionally by the Spirit in him. But when Paul writes Christ in you, the hope of glory, that is not a positional verse. That is a verse of maturity. Paul wrote to a bunch of Corinthians one time, 2 Corinthians 13, and says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Know you not your own selves how that Christ be in you except you be reprobate. Were they saved? They were Christian. They, Paul's writing to believers. These believers were like, and, and to be honest with you, man, there are saved people that can sit in these pews and not know whether what I'm saying is the truth or not. They don't know if, if I'm telling the truth or the preacher down the road's telling the truth. You know why? You're a reprobate. That's what that means. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Amen. If you have the mind of Christ, you know those who have Christ in them. Yeah. Yes, sir. The same spirit that puts Christ and forms Christ in one man is the same spirit doing it in me. Therefore, that spirit brings us into unity through one faith, one knowledge, one unity in the faith. I hear a man over here talking, I'm like, that man's got Christ in him. Hear a man over here talking, don't, not saying he's not saved, but I listen to that man and I say that, that man don't have Christ in him. He's not speaking with the mind of Christ. You understand? So Christ in you is a statement of maturity. This is what Paul's talking about. 
And when you understand that Christ in you, the hope of glory, is maturity, you go back and read the chapter now in Colossians chapter 1, and you'll see how that Christ is formed in you by the mystery and the dispensation given to Paul. They're in direct correlation. A man dragging you back to Moses every Sunday is not ministering life to you. He's ministering death. A man that's got you in Paul's epistles every Sunday teaching you the fellowship of the mystery is a man ministering the life of Jesus Christ to you. And I promise you, you give it three years, you give it three years of a man ministering the dispensation of grace and a man ministering the dispensation of the law and we'll see which people have progressed and matured into perfection in Christ and those still in the bondage of sin and death. We know what we're doing, man. I know what I'm doing. Even if you don't know if I, even if you sit out there and ain't sure if if I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. Amen. Paul tells you in verse 28, I know what I'm doing. He said, I'm preaching, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Not just present them in Christ, but perfect in Christ. How many times did Paul say that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run nor labored in vain? What was Paul's rejoicing? What was his glory? His people in the presence of Christ at at his coming. My glory in my labor bill is going to be the perfecting of, of you people when you stand before Christ one day. Amen. I may not ever get to rejoice down here. Amen. May never happen. I may not ever get to get up and be like, hey, brother, we baptized 5,000 last Sunday and, and done this, 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 and this. My rejoicing, Paul said, judge nothing before the time. Yeah. But when God will bring to, bring to light the, the, uh, the hidden counsels of the heart, And you see, these two hindrances to our perfection, Galatians is the great epistle of correction. Galatians is such an important epistle, folks. I mean, I I rank it up there with the book of Romans. I really do. Galatians is a great epistle of correction, and its appearance right before the book of Ephesians is not without meaning. The reason it appears before the book of Ephesians is because Galatians contains your necessary correction before you can receive the doctrine of Ephesians. Amen? You can't understand your position in Christ while you're down here living like a Galatian on the rudiments of the world. Until you can grasp the fact of Galatians that you are crucified unto the world and the world unto you, there's no need to try to take you and seat you in heavenly places in Christ. People down here arguing about water and what day of the week we go to church on. Them people ain't ready for the book of Ephesians. They're under rudimentary religion. Paul said, beware lest any man spoil you. How? Through philosophy, vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Galatians is essential correction. The Galatians were saved people who had been removed from the grace of God through a perversion of the gospel of Christ. And that perversion dominates most churches and believers today. A perversion of Christ's gospel. What was that perversion? That once you're saved, you have to perform and seek perfection through the works of the flesh. That dominates fundamental independent Baptist churches. I've been in them my whole life. Oh yeah, we're saved by grace. But if you don't do this, this, and this, and this, you're probably not really saved. Mm -hmm. Heard it. Heard it my whole life. What 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 are the things that they put you under? Tithing. Amen. Water baptism. Church attendance. Amen. And the reality is people sit in them systems for 30 and 40 years and do every bit of those things. 
And the life of Christ is never perfected in him. Amen. Paul tells him, look there in Galatians chapter 4 real quick. Then I'm going to move on. Galatians 4. I love this chapter, man. This chapter right here, it, it's essential. What Paul is getting ready to do, man, in Ephesians is take you and show you the inheritance. Amen? Yeah. Did he not say that we may know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance? Amen. Right? But right here in Galatians chapter 3, look, look at the end of the verse, at the end of the chapter there in chapter 3. If ye be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, God made a bunch of promises to Abraham and to his seed. And that seed was Jesus Christ. Only one. Right? Yeah. And then when you got in Christ, you become an heir of those promises. Because, listen, we're not Paul and Bill and Gordon anymore. We're all one in Christ. As many as were baptized in the Christ have put on Christ. And because I've put on Christ and I'm now one with him, I'm a joint heir with him. I'm an heir according to those promises. Amen. And so Paul says now in chapter 4 verse 1, Now this I say, the heir, you, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. So Paul's going to take, he's going to show you here, Two positions of an heir, a child and a son. As a child, he's under tutors and governors. As a son, he's an adult no longer under those things. And so Paul says, listen, the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Right? Even so, when we, even so, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of what? Sons. What is this adoption of sons? Verse 6. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his what? Into where? Crying Abba, Father. Listen, is Christ a child or is he a son? What does he lack, Bill? God don't think he lack, God doesn't think he lacks a thing. Amen. God has to think awful highly of a man to set him at his own right hand and say, "You run all of it." Amen. God put me in that son. I no longer need the tutors and governors because through this spirit I now have received the fullness of the Son of God. Everything I need to make me an adult son, everything I need to make me mature in Christ was given to me the moment the Spirit of God baptized me into the body of Christ. So Paul's prayer, get this, because we're showing you what maturity is. This topic here takes up, you want to know the theme? The theme of Ephesians through Colossians, it's right there. That's the theme. That I may win who? Amen? Christ in you, the hope of glory. The theme of Ephesians through Colossians is Christ in you. Look at, look at Galatians 4.19 now. I think it's 4.19. Is that where it says, my little children? My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until what? Then how can it be positional? Amen? Christ in you is the work of the Spirit of God in you. If you want to know what the Spirit of God came to do, it wasn't to give you goosebumps. And give you a good feeling when you're in church. People are so carnal today, they can't tell the difference between flesh and spirit. You go into a church and they're dancing and got good music and you feel good. And people come out, oh, it was such a spiritual service. That was nothing but carnal flesh for an hour and a half, two hours. You're right, preacher. 
People wouldn't know, the, wouldn't know spiritual things, but jumped up and smacked them right between the eyes. They wouldn't understand spiritual things. Spirits are right here. Amen. You listen to music. You listen to people speak. You listen to Bible teachers. You listen to the news. As you're listening to these things, there's spirits at work in the mind. And so you've got to understand these spiritual things. And the Spirit of God came to form Christ in us. And the thing to understand about this is our union to Christ was not to simply put you in heaven. The main goal of it was to get Christ in you. God's will for heaven and earth is for all things in heaven and earth to be filled by His Son. Amen. That's the will of God. And this is accomplished by a new mind given to us by the Spirit in the Word of God through faith. How does a man minister the Spirit? Oil. See, here we go again, right? Confusing spiritual things with physical things. Right here, let me, let me dump some oil on your head. You got more of the Spirit now. You know, just goofy stuff like that. Paul said, how did you receive the Spirit? By the works of the law or what? The hearing of what? How did you get the Spirit? Through the ear hole, man. He just told you that. He said, did you get God's Spirit by doing something or by simple hearing? And then he said, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? He said, he that ministereth the Spirit to you. Or worketh miracles among you. Doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? This book ministers God's spirit to us. You are never going to separate the spirit of God from his word. Christ said the words I speak, they are spirit, they are life. Listen man, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Words can kill you and destroy you or they can save you and give you life. Amen. Romans 8, 6, Paul said to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. You know what that means? You can't live without a new mind. People say, how do you live the Christian life? It begins in the mind. It ain't a set of do's and don'ts. To be spiritually minded is life. Well, if you're not spiritually minded, you're not living. Right. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So life is in the mind. Transformation is in the mind. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 15. Paul talks about the natural man and the spiritual man. Well, what's the difference between the two in what they hear and receive? Yeah. That's simple. There's two kinds of wisdom. A wisdom of the world and a wisdom of God. The spiritual man hears the wisdom of God. The natural man don't. Yep. Ephesians 4.23 says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The spirit of your mind. And so, and so, listen, what Christ is, the way we receive Christ in us and the new man is put on is by the Spirit of God renewing the mind and giving you the very mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he indwells. And Ephesians is the epistle where Paul shows us this maturity and perfecting of our union to Christ or the spiritual blessings and riches of his glory and grace. But you got to remember, first of all, the principles of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and that is the natural man will not receive these things. Listen, you can sit and take a natural man and tell him he's seated in heavenly places all day long. It's foolishness to him. He has no ability to discern spiritual things. Paul said the things we speak are discerned spiritually. Didn't he? 1 Corinthians 2.13 which things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 
But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That's what cracks me up, natural men trying to correct people. It's got the mind of Christ. Isn't that, isn't that contrary to all creation? Man, man spends time in the book and God has given him the very mind of Christ and then some carnal natural man wants to come around trying to correct him. You can't judge a man with the mind of Christ. He's judged of no man. Because there ain't a man in this world other than us who have the mind of Christ that's known the mind of the Lord. You may have known what the Pope said. You may have known what Oliver Green said. That doesn't mean anything to me. Amen, amen, amen. The natural man, the natural man is not going to receive the book of Ephesians. Paul told the Corinthians down there in chapter 3. He had told them in chapter 2, I've got this great hidden wisdom and mystery to show you people. He said, but the natural man don't receive it. So in chapter 3, he said, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. He said, I've got the mind of Christ, but I couldn't speak to you as those who have the mind of Christ. He said, I had to speak unto you as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. He said, I have fed you with milk and not with strong meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there's among you envy, strife, and contention, are you not carnal and walk as men? So what am I saying here? The point I'm making is this. Before a man can receive the strong meat of the book of Ephesians, he's got to first partake in the milk of Romans through Galatians. Galatians. God didn't put those books in that order for no reason. And the point I'm making is this. No man has any business running to Ephesians. And talking about good works and walking worthy when the milk of Romans through Galatians upsets his little baby tummy. Amen. I've listened to people my whole life that want to talk about the good works of Ephesians 2.10, the worthy walk of Ephesians 4, and you couldn't, get, you couldn't have an intelligent conversation with them on the first eight chapters of Romans if you had to. There's a process to this thing. And the process is we sit, then we walk, and then we stand. Amen? The book of Ephesians, let me cover a few things here, and we'll pick up with the rest of it next week. The first part of this thing to sit, sit in Christ, it's the subject of the first two chapters of Ephesians. And then when you get into chapter 3, Paul transitions in chapter 3 to our walk. And our walk in Christ is directly connected with the dispensation of grace given to Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. You can't get around it. You were put up here and Paul was given a special dispensation to dispense to us down here in the earth the treasures that are now hid in Christ. And so when he comes into chapter 4 and says walk worthy of the calling, that walk is directly connected to the dispensation of grace. And I'm going to show you this as we get to it. When Paul says over there, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, he's referring to the grace and the gift that was given to Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. And we're, going to, we're going to see all this. But the book of Ephesians begins in chapter 1 verse 3 with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's how it begins. And, uh, and it, he comes down in chapter 1 and he concludes chapter 1 basically with a prayer for our understanding to be enlightened to know the hope, the riches, and the power that we now have in Christ. Amen. I want you to note spiritual blessings in heavenly places is not physical blessings in earthly places. Yeah. There comes a time when we got to get our priorities in order. 
Amen. Godliness with contentment is great gain, folks. Nothing in this life is going to last. Paul said we came into this world naked. We brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Having therefore food and raiment, let us therewith be content. For godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen? Amen. I believe that. And we, we, listen, listen, the reality is if we will seek the spiritual blessings we have in Christ in heavenly places the same way we seek physical pleasures in earthly places, something will get done in your spiritual life. But you don't, get, you don't get to say, well, God bless me with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and that's a positional thing, and therefore it's, you know, I'm just going to sit down here on the earth and do whatever. God has given you those things, and you have access to them right now by the Spirit of God. But where's our priority? Amen. Jesus Christ must become the priority that dominates your life or you can forget even talking to me about this. Don't talk to me about walking worthy of anything until Jesus Christ, knowing him, becomes the priority that dominates your life. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Second, Knowing that these things are spiritual and in heavenly places, how can we find these great treasures? You see, a carnal man is like this. This is why he can't discern spiritual things. You tell a carnal man he's seated in heavenly places, he has no spiritual comprehension. He only pictures the physical. And because the physical and carnal mind can't imagine that reality, he doesn't understand it. I, I, I can see it be, be as clear as I'm standing here right now. Amen. When I woke up this morning, man, I was seated in him. And it's not, it's, I'm sealed there, man. Worried about this stuff here. There you go. Amen. I've learned to seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. I know what I have access to. You cannot seek spiritual blessings in heavenly places in the physical world. They're not at the Vatican, man. Amen. They're not in, in any seminary. Where are they at? They're in Christ. In Him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And you're in Him. But you're going to have to learn how to access those treasures. Right. Understanding our position is the key to our spiritual maturity. And Ephesians 1.13 tells you something there. I'm almost done, folks. Bear with me here. Ephesians 1.13 shows you something. The moment you heard and believed the gospel of your salvation. An absolute miracle took place. I didn't feel it, Bill. Did you feel it? I didn't feel it. Did you feel it, Corn? Must have been something spiritual then, huh? Couldn't have been physical if we didn't feel it. I've seen them people that feel stuff. It don't last. Oh, I, I went to a church and, and you got, I was drunk and went down the altar and the smell of alcohol left my breath and two months later I laid up drunk again, right? I know people go through that religious, superstitious stuff. Bill, I heard Jesus Christ died for my sins and was, and was buried and rose again the third day and that through his death I didn't have to go to hell. Amen. And I knew that was the only chance I had anyway. But I trust him. Yes, sir. I didn't feel nothing. You ain't going to understand these things. That's why they're put in the book for you. When Paul said, in whom ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, you wouldn't have knew that happened unless you read it in the book. Amen. Yes, sir. So how do you discern it? Spiritually, right. not physically. And so I started learning these great truths. 
And one of the great truths I learned is that when I believed that gospel, an absolute miracle took place. The Spirit of God took me, Bill, and circumcised my flesh. He, through, through that baptism, I have put off this old, vile, sinful man. And he joined me to a, to a new spiritual man, now seated in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. That happened. And now I'm up there, seated and sealed in Him unto the day of redemption. Now, that miracle took place whether you know it, believe it, feel it, felt it or not. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Galatians 3.27 says, As many as of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ have put on Christ. Romans 6.3 says that we were baptized into his death. We are completely identified in Jesus Christ. I, I mean, God sees it. The hope is that you would see it. God made you, God perfected you the moment he put you in his son. Paul said you're complete in him. Yes. Amen. And what the Christian life is, is taking that identity and making it a reality in your life. Amen. Amen. We are completely identified in Christ. This is what Paul calls the fellowship of his son in 1 Corinthians 1.9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his dear son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You know what the fellowship, you know what it means to be called into the fellowship of his son? You know what fellowship you have? His death. His burial. His resurrection. Let me, let me, let me tell you, God raised us up together. Amen. Sure. You see, that's my life. My life is not a rehabilitated Paul Lucas. My life is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yeah. I'm raised up with him, Bill. Amen. Amen. The fellowship is his resurrection, his ascension, his position, his inheritance. His wisdom, His righteousness, His life, His power. I have fellowship into all of it. But we must grasp reality of this union to Him to understand how, we, how this thing operates. It's not imaginary. I mean, listen, did God, when God created this union between you and His Son... Paul said we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. When God did this work, did he give you everything you needed or not? Amen. Are you complete in him or not? Then what's this begging and snotting all about? Right, Amen. Amen. You blessed with all spiritual blessings? What are you begging God for? Did he, did he tell Paul, my grace is sufficient? What did Paul say? Okay, I'm going to quit begging about this thorn in the side then. He said, and rather than asking God to get rid of it, I'm going to glory in it. You got all sufficiency through, are you under grace? Then you have all sufficiency. God said, my grace is sufficient. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We've got it all. We sit down here and we beg God and we, we play games with God. God, if I, if I perform better, will you give me something then? He already gave you everything. We just have to learn how to access it by faith. Amen. Let me show you this. This is the beauty of what happened. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. <laughs> you, 
you got in there in 1983, Bill. I was three years old, you know. What, too many years later, though, young teenager, I got into that thing. Amen? We didn't know it. My goodness, we wouldn't meet for another, my goodness, 20-some years or so. Close to 30 years. But man, we've been connected all along. This is, this, this is why, this, you know, I know people have a hard time understanding this. This is, why, this is why I can meet a Christian in another country and feel like I've known him for years. Yeah. Amen? And go talk to one of my cousins I haven't seen in a month and just, just stare at and don't have nothing in common. Right. Amen? But you see this down here? You take, you take me... John Loudon, Bill, Corin, just, just all of us. You take this stuff right here, that spirit's in all of us. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. I don't care how many times you've had your head ducked in water, is Christ in is that spirit in you or not? If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Amen? But you see that, that union right there? That's real. Amen. It's not imaginary. That spirit right there, where's he seated at? There. So, do I, so am I seated in heavenly places in Christ? Absolutely I am. Not physically. Spiritually. Right. See that right there? That same spirit's in John. That same spirit's in Bill. That same spirit's in Corinth. So we're all connected to Christ. But guess what? We're all in each other also. That's the one body. By this spirit, we are all baptized into one body. But you have to, when we come into Ephesians 4, when Paul starts talking about the worthy walk, that walking worthy of Christ can only come through the fullness and perfecting of that spirit. The union that we all share is according to the measure of Christ in us. Let's, 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 let's look at it like this. Let's say I have 40% measure of the fullness of Christ. If you was to measure it, you'd say this man's got 40% of the, of the fullness of Christ in him. Then you've got another person over here that's got 10%. Paul talks about whom the whole body fitly joined to together and compacted by that which every joint. What is a joint? It's a connector. How are we compacted? We're compacted by that which every joint supplieth. But this joint, you take a man over here with 40 and a man over here with 10, you know what that connection is? It's 10. Amen? Amen? Now this person here can impart more of Christ into that believer. But this one right here, this one right here, you have to understand that setting back and not allowing Christ to be formed in you is detrimental to the work of the body of Christ. Because all you want to do is go to heaven when you die. Nothing else matters. And the body of Christ is suffering down here because of members of the body that will not allow this gift of Christ to work in them, to perfect them, and to have Christ to dwell in them. Amen. But it all comes down to understanding, first off, the position. You have to understand that. You have access up there. And because of this union, we can see the unseen. I can see what I cannot see. I can hear what ear cannot hear. Isn't that what Paul said? I have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man. But God hath revealed them unto us how? By his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, even the deep things of God. The deep things of God in me. Little dirt man down here, you know. God giving him access into his deep thoughts. 
given me access to things he hid from all the principalities and powers since the beginning of the world. And it took me and put him in his son and gave me access to unsearchable riches. Gave me access to the mind of almighty God about things that he had kept secret since the world began. And I'm going to snub my nose at it? Absolutely not. We hear what's unheard and we find what's unsearchable. And through this, we are empowered. We are empowered to be seated above all the principalities and powers in heavenly places. There's not a power in this world that can match the power of Christ in us. There's not a lie the media can listen, man. I watch the news, I watch the media of this world, and I scoff and I laugh at it, Bill. It's, 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 a, it's, it's ridiculous. And I know what's behind it all. These people, these people silencing Trump on Twitter. I don't care about Trump. But I know what they're ultimately after. And it ain't Trump. It's right there. And if you think it's going to end with Trump, you don't know a thing. That's what they're coming after. Amen. It's about these, these things right here, man, but if you allow this power to be perfected in you, Christ's power is now seated above all these things. And through him working in you, Bill, the wisdom and the power of this world can't go anywhere with us. We're able to stand against it. Ephesians chapter 6. And so, and so understanding this position, look at, look at verse 20 and I'm done. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm sorry. Ephesians 1. Paul's prayer, verse 17, I'm sorry. His prayer is that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Or do you get, how do we get that? No, that spirit is a little ash. You understand that? You see that? We got the spirit, capital S. The spirit, little s, that he's talking about, is a spirit that's been given to us by the Spirit of God that is now in us through the knowledge and wisdom that He gives. And what He's talking about here is, is there's people who have the Spirit, they're in Christ, but they've not been given the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. In the knowledge of who? Christ. What is it? What is the Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him? Well, He tells you. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of whose calling? His or yours? His. God gave him a calling. And you're a part of it now. And Paul tells you to walk worthy of it. It's his calling, Bill. What, do we realize as being members of the body of Christ that we can hinder the calling of Christ? Christ called us into it by His grace, Bill. We've been called into this great calling of God Almighty. But look what He calls it there. He says that you may know what is the hope of His calling, the riches of the glory of whose inheritance? His inheritance, verse 19, and the exceeding greatness of whose power is why Paul calls it the knowledge of Him. Paul wants you to understand through the Spirit granting unto us this spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, we would know the hope of His calling. And by knowing His calling, where we fall into that calling. The riches of the glory of His inheritance. Bill, we've got the riches of the glory of His inheritance now in us. And the exceeding greatness of His power to us word who believe. What power? The power he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand far above all principality and power. There should be nothing more powerful than the body of Christ in this earth right now. Nothing. 
Amen. We should, be, we should be seated above the media, the government, the school system. Amen. Sure. People walk into churches all day long. There's no power of Christ found in them. No power of Christ. People sitting in churches today are just as dark and confused as, as the majority, as, as Hollywood actors and actresses. They're just in darkness and confused. There's no power of Christ in them. Paul's prayer is that we would know these things. What's he talking about? His calling, his inheritance, his power. Look at verse 23. His body. The fullness of him. Most of what is all this about? It's about Christ. You're never, you're never going to be able to live this thing out. Until you understand this calling and, and your position in the Son of God. And that you are a partaker in these things. When God, when God joined you to his Son in heavenly places, he called you into his eternal purpose, which he had in Christ. Right. Amen? Yes, this purpose was given to Christ before the world began. Now the great mystery is that he was going to call Paul Lucas into that too. This new power God's creating in heavenly places, I'm a part of it. Amen. God's called me, man, to be above the powers of this present world. Yes, sir. But the only way I can be truly equipped for this purpose is for that man's life to dwell in me richly. And to completely renew my mind. Bill, if I was to go up there right now, I sit, I sit down here sometimes and I think, God, I know what you called me to, man, but it ain't, there ain't no way I'm ready for it. Hey, man, I'm so foolish. I'm so ignorant. To be called up into the heavenly places as a joint heir with the Son of God. To receive an inheritance in heavenly places as a, as, a, as a principality and power of the heavenly realm? I sit sometimes, I don't even know what advice to give my children sometimes. I don't even know how to be a good husband a lot of the times, Bill. But I know this. There's only one way that I'm going to ever going to get equipped. And I'm pressing on. I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that high calling of God is Christ in you. And I know where to get him. Amen. He's contained on the pages of this old book right here. Minister to us not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, by faith. Amen. Next week, we're going to get into Ephesians chapter 2 and show you seven things there that Paul shows you is the benefit of your position. We're now nigh. <laughs> we're no longer far away, Bill, strangers, and, and we're, we're nigh. We've been made nigh by the blood of Christ. Fellow citizens, <laughs> amen, and of the household of God, and he shows Seven things there about what God has done by placing us in Christ. And then he begins chapter 3 by saying, for this cause. The dispensation of grace given to Paul was for what God was now doing in creating a new man in Christ. And we'll get into that stuff. It, it, it all builds up. Once you understand the position and then understand the dispensation of the grace of God given to the body of Christ by Paul, then you'll be able to understand the worthy walk in chapter 4 of allowing Christ to, to, to dwell in you richly by the word of God. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for another day. God, I, I pray, Lord, as we study these things out, God, I see them so clearly, Lord, but how to communicate them sometimes is difficult. And Father, I just pray that you would take these, these words and the messages that I preached here, Lord. But more importantly, I pray 
uh, that as the, the people here study these things out in the word, in your word also, Father, that you would open their eyes to see them clearer than I could ever present them. And God, I just pray as we go through this study in Ephesians, God, teach us uh, just how true our position in Christ is and what that means as far as our access into these spiritual blessings and into these unsearchable riches, Lord. Teach us how to seek them by faith. We just pray, God, that your spirit would grant each and every one of us to be uh, strengthened with might by, by, by your spirit in our inner man and that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. And Lord, I just pray that you would make this church, Lord, a church where the power of Christ truly resides, uh, that we can stand against all the wiles of the devil, Father. We know that the majority of religion today is under the dominion and darkness and confusion and perversion of Satan and his ministers, Father, but we pray that this little church would be a church where the power of Christ resides, where we take the spiritual weapons of our warfare, God, and, and cast down these strongholds. Lord, I pray that you'd keep everybody safe, bring them back safely next point of time. We ask it all in Jesus' lovely and precious name. Amen. Amen.